I am Alan. I'm going to be doing a presentation on, well, ham radio with a side of Linux. Um, the reason I phrased it that way is because, well, I mean, we all know Linux. It's the OS, so how can ham radio be involved with it? Well, we'll get to that. So before I continue, does anybody, don't say anything, but with a show of hands, does anybody know why I use this background? No? Anybody know the significance of it? Send messages and code messages? No. The background is actually the official tartan of Debian. Okay? And there's a reason for that. Yeah. Yeah, the tartan actually spells out Debian in Moore's code. Um, apparently, Ian was a ham radio, or is a ham radio operator. So, was, was, sorry. Um, so yeah, just a bit of odd trivia there. <laughs> Learn something new every day, right? So a little about me. I was licensed 27 years ago. Um, I was introduced to ham radio by a friend in elementary school. Um, he got licensed, I think it was in grade six or seven. And that was back when you needed uh, 10 words a minute Morse code. And the exam was ridiculously long. And they, they were starting to suffer because they weren't getting enough people interested in it. Um, I didn't get licensed for a number of years after that. Uh, I had a friend who was moving to Keswick, and we lived in Markham, and hey, long distance is expensive. So my friend who introduced me to ham radio in the first place said to a bunch of us, why don't you get your licenses? It happens that that summer we were at the exhibition, we were wandering through the Hobbies building when it actually had hobbies in it. And the amateur radio display was uh, being manned by the York Region Amateur Radio Club. Back then, each day, a different radio club from Southern Ontario would look after the booth. And it just so happens it was York Region. So after talking to them and uh, finding out that they ran a course every fall, uh, we signed up for it, and well, that is that. Got our radio licenses and uh, joined the club. And fun ensued. In 2007, I got my Morse code, uh, five words a minute. That gave me access to more of the bands available, so more frequencies. And that's still true today. There's uh, there's sort of two levels, and you have to uh, either pass the basic with 80 plus percent, or do your basic plus your Morse code to get a uh, to get all of the frequencies available to you. I was also a membership director for many years with the club, and um, we uh, I served as emergency coordinator also for York Region uh, for their amateur radio emergency services, and I'll talk more about that a little further down the line. Ham radio in Canada. So ham radio is a licensed form of communication. It's uh, worldwide licensed. Um, there is testing involved. There are exams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how, and Industry Canada is the one who handles that in Canada. The governing body, however, is Radio Amateurs of Canada. They're a nonprofit organization that basically goes to bat for all of the amateur radio operators in Canada. And they also attend the World Radio, um, World radio Forum that happens, I believe, every five years. Um, it lasts three to four weeks. It's a, it's a massive conference and they represent Canada uh, in that. And at that conference is where they discuss what frequencies are available to amateur radio operators depending on the area of the world and also any changes to 
uh, the laws that may pertain to different parts of the world as well. So in Canada, as I said, we're licensed. As part of the license, we get issued a call sign. These are the Ontario, or sorry, the Canadian call signs. Um, in 97, they started issuing the VAs. Prior to that, it was the VEs. And you can see there's a VAs sort of throughout there. Um, when I got licensed in 97, I just happened to walk into the Industry Canada office the day they started issuing the VAs. So I got my initials because why not get something that means something to me? Um, so my call sign is VA3WAH, Victor Alpha 3 Whiskey Alpha Hotel. And WAH, the suffix, is my initials. So, so as mentioned before, there's many different bands in the amateur radio hobby. Um, outside of the military, we probably have the most access to the frequency bandwidths, period. Um, and that comes in handy. Uh, we go all the way up to 250 gigahertz, which is amateur satellite communication. And there is uh, several satellites up there. I can't remember what the current total is right now, but most of them are about the size of four shoe boxes. They're not very large, but they are up there and they do work. Um, just a bit of information, the International Space Station has a ham radio set on board and they do use it quite often um, to talk to students and just to make contacts. Um, I remember uh, hearing one of the astronauts talking about that's what he did in his spare time. He'd just go sit on the bands and talk around the world, quite literally. Um, so the most common bands are VHF, UHF, and HF. Um, when most people get licensed, the first thing they generally do is pick up a handheld, something like that. And there's many repeaters around that they can use to talk to people. And the repeaters are interesting because, well, we use things called linking. So one repeater can link to another, can link to another, can link to another. So we can link all around Canada, the world, using repeaters, using the internet. Ham radio has always been on the brink of, of pushing technology. Which brings me to what use does ham radio have in the modern world? Yeah, we have remote communication. There's still a lot of areas where it's come in handy because of uh, where people are. Satellite communication is very expensive. It's not viable in some cases. Um, I have a friend who's from Ghana and his village, they didn't have telephones, but uh, through one of his professors, they got a ham radio set. And now they have, oh, a few dozen people in the village who are licensed for ham radio. That is a, is a very, very cool thing in my opinion. So I mentioned that uh, I, was, I belong to the York Region Amateur Radio Club. One of our main uh, things that we do is community service. So we look after several parades, several bikeathons, um, running events, pretty much anything that uh, that we can be used for communication, I guess. And um, one thing that uh, I got involved in for a while was. Um, uh, car rallying. So all the performance car rallying across Canada is actually run on ham radio. Um, that started probably about 30 years ago uh, with our club actually. It just happens that several members of our club were also part of the rally community and one thing led to another. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it 
was a good alternative when you're up in places like Bancroft and you don't have good cell reception, et cetera, et cetera, ham radio can come in handy. And for many years, we actually uh, would bring our own antenna. Um, why are you going? Bring our own antenna with us and repeater to Bancroft to cover the area um, because there was no repeaters up there either. But because we have the technology and we happen to have a, a portable 100-foot tower, um, I know, we just happen to have one, uh, we would uh, bring that along with us. And we use that for several community events, uh, including just dragging it along in a parade to promote the hobby. Um, it, it definitely was a spectacle and a lot of people took notice of it. Um, that was sort of a, well, it was a gift, so to speak, from uh, uh, Emergency Measures Ontario uh, way back. So I have up there weather services. The Environment Canada has a program called uh, CanWarn. And the idea of the program is to actually get eyes on the ground. It makes a lot more sense for them to work with actual reports than it does uh, radar, et cetera, especially when it gets bad, because radar can only penetrate so much. So if they have somebody on the ground giving actual reports of severe weather, they can use that. The program was started, um, I believe, back in the 70s. Uh, but in the last 20 years, the person who took it over decided to merge it with their community outreach program, which basically allowed for people to call in weather or et cetera, and merge them together so everybody was under the same umbrella. And he also introduced things like you can tweet to the weather office. You can, um, you can send Instagram pictures. They actually monitor social media uh, for, again, eyes on the ground. It, it really helps. But from an amateur radio point of view, when there is a severe weather warning, uh, that station at the weather office at Dufferin and Steeles is manned, and our reports are taken as priority. Um, and as the weather gets more severe, stop going to sleep, uh, as the weather gets more severe, then uh, we get uh, we get to, uh, um, we, sorry, we start a, what's called a formal net. So in other words, there's a hierarchy to what you report. For example, if it's just a standard uh, storm and it starts to hail, yeah, we'll report hail. As hail gets bigger, that becomes a problem. Now, if there's tornado sightings, then what will generally happen is they will say, okay, we will ask for reports from certain people, but if you see anything above X, call in and say you have emergency traffic. So it, uh, it becomes very formal at that point, uh, which sort of lends itself to also emergency services. So Amateur Radio Emergency Services is a backup communication service provided to municipalities, regions, uh, provincial and federal. Uh, we are also the communications or the de facto communications branch of the Red Cross. We have a standing agreement with them, um, a document of understanding with them across Canada. And I believe they do in the states as well. Um, so for many years, I was the emergency coordinator. So I would work with, in most cases, the region and the municipalities in York region uh, to uh, get ourselves put into their emergency plan as backup communications in the case that something serious happened and something knocked out their communications. And let me tell you, as technology gets better, uh, their communications are more susceptible. Um, whereas ours, we still have the capability of talking radio to radio. They don't. So 
uh, it kind of lends <laughs> to our talents. Also, for example, on, uh, for Y2K, we set up a communications net, which worked out to be a good exercise, all things considered. Um, we had 12 locations across York Region. We had, uh, I believe, 15 locations across Ontario, and we had uh, at least one person in every RCMP main office across Canada. So we had all OPP, RCMP covered, not by my club, but by various clubs, and York Region covered uh, all, the fire, all the police stations, some fire stations, and the, ambul and the uh, hospitals in York Region. And it was, a, it was done as a very formal exercise. The fact that nothing happened, that's a good thing. Um, our biggest uh, scare of the night was when Markham Stillville Hospital couldn't get a hold of Newmarket. The phone lines weren't going through. So we ended up uh, trying to track down the telecommunications person for Markham Stillville Hospital, which uh, we couldn't find, so we actually sent a police officer to his house. Um, and he wasn't sure what was going on, so he checked with his staff and found out that somebody actually scheduled an exchange change that night. <laughs> Why? We're not sure, but none of the PBXs were updated, so when they were hitting the buttons, you know, it wasn't dialing the right numbers. But that was, that was our excitement for the night. Other than that, we just did regular check-ins to make sure everything was okay, and we did regular check-ins with, uh, with our local OPP office in Aurora and our local RCMP office in Newmarket. So, and we watched, actually, we just sat there and watched TV most of the night. Um, luckily, we had a great location. Um, our clubhouse was the back of St. Andrew's College. They had an old portable there that was given to us, and it served as a great location. We weren't bothered by anybody, and we had lots of space to put maps out and keep track of everything. So it, it did act as an excellent exercise, but as everybody knows, it was kind of a non-event. Contesting. I kind of had these in a specific order. So contesting is basically how many people can I talk to? How many people from different parts of the world can I talk to? How many countries can I talk to? How many islands can I talk to? If you can, if you can uh, put a number to it, there's probably a contest about it. Uh, the most popular one is Field Day. Field Day is run by the American, Relay, Ra the American Radio Relay League, which is the US equivalent of Radio Amateurs of Canada. And it's primarily North American, but uh, we do have uh, people who participate worldwide. And it's a 24-hour contest. How many, contacts, how many contacts can you make? Um, and for each contact you make, you get specific points depending on how you've made it. So for example, digital contacts, I believe, get two points each. Um, Certain uh, CW contacts get so many points. If you are on uh, backup power, you get more points, things like that. So a lot of clubs actually use it as an exercise. Let's go into a field, let's set up generators, whatever, and see if we can get on the air and see how many contacts we can make. And there's actually a, a winter field day that uh, our clubs participated in the last three years, and it was uh, about five weeks ago, five, six weeks ago. And uh, that one's much colder. Luckily, our, our club has a nice trailer with, uh, with a heating unit and everything in it, and they rent a, a nice box truck as the kitchen and dinette. So they, they make do, but uh, the summer one's more like a picnic than anything else. And it's, it's fun. Uh, but it also sort of goes to prove what we can do and 
uh, goes to show what we can set up in a specific period of time. Um, I believe last year, if memory serves, we came in first in our division uh, for our club came in first in their division. And uh, reg chewing. <laughs> All that means is just talking. You know, having a conversation with people anywhere in the world. Uh, one of my most, uh, I guess, interesting contacts was um, at the Ontario Science Center. They have a ham radio booth there. And when I was in college, I volunteered there for a little while. Oops, I keep doing that. Anyways, uh, the contact we made was, um, and I threw myself off. Who was it that I talked to? King Hussein of Jordan. That's who it was. <laughs> yes, it was very cool. Um, we happened to just be playing around, uh, looking for someone on the bands, and we stopped and called CQ. CQ basically is, is there anybody out there to t who wants to talk to me? Anybody wants to make a contact? And uh, King Hussein of Jordan returned. And we had about six people standing out in front of the booth and heard the, heard the little uh, uh, back and forth, and that was very, very cool. Another one that uh, I think is kind of neat is, does anybody know of the show Last Man Standing? Yes. It's Tim's, Tim, Tim Allen's latest show. Um, for whatever reason, uh, one of the crew said in Tim Allen's office, basically if you aren't familiar with the show, he's an advertising executive and part owner of a big box sporting goods store. So, sort of like your Bass Pro and your Cabela's. Um, why don't we put a ham radio set in the corner of his office? Well, that not only sparked a interest for the crew, but Tim Allen is also licensed now, and I believe half the actors on the show are also licensed, and most of the, most of the crew is licensed. Um, on their days, actually today, um, if I had my radio set up differently, I might have been able to, to show it. But today, they are actually broadcasting from the set. Um, during their dinner break, they, on certain days, they, on filming days, they'll actually broadcast from the set and see how many contacts they can make. It, it's kind of neat. So, you know, just... Interesting, uh, interesting little facts. There are actually quite a few celebrities who are ham radio operators and enjoy the hobby. Um, it's not highly unusual to, um, to run into them on the air. Quite a few country singers actually too, for whatever reason, I don't know why. Okay, the, sorry? They need the stories for the songs. Yeah, maybe, who knows. Why Linux? Why Linux? It's free. It's always good. Um, like ham radio, there's lots of tinkering you can do. Ham radio operators, generally speaking, are tinkerers. We like to play around with new things. We always want to push the envelope, etc. So Linux pretty much does that. It's free. Uh, I mentioned that, yeah. Ham radio operators are cheap. It's true. The, uh, okay, frugal. <laughs> but it does lend itself to, uh, to the sort of same feeling as ham radio in the fact that it is community supported, which a lot of ham radio stuff is. Uh, to the point where Debian has actually released a pure blend uh, for amateur radio. So you can download a Debian dis, uh, CD, whatever, distro that has probably about 50, 60 different pieces of software inst pre-installed on it for amateur radio. And I believe there's also a Raspberry. This is just a bit 
of some of the software available. Um, and yeah, that's just a small percentage of it. I remember back when I first started playing with Linux, I think it was back in high school, and Buddy and I and I were at our local CD-ROM sh uh, shop, and we see this double wide CD package that had a little devil on it, and it said Linux. Okay, well, let's see what this is. So, I mean, we were familiar with what Linux was, but we'd never tried it, so let's try it. And the first time when we were installing it, going through building the kernel and going through all the questions and answers and everything, one thing we noticed was there's a lot of amateur radio software right off the bat. It was very well adopted by the amateur radio community, which is kind of neat. And that was before I got my license, actually. So um, it was definitely uh, something that we looked at once we got our licenses. Uh, one of the reasons, or one of the things I got my license, or sorry, one of the things I did after I got my license was uh, I really got involved in what was called packet, which was digital communications over ham radio. Basically the precursor to wireless internet, for lack of a better explanation. And AX25, yes, yeah, AX25, the protocol that you could run on a coat hanger. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, my setup, well, I had various setups over the years, but one of my setups was actually a compact, not compact the company, compact the, as in small, 286, running DOS, uh, running a full TCP IP stack, and running, uh, a packet node on it. So a terminal node controller software uh, connected to my, my um, packet modem. I was able to network into it and then go out on the air and then connect up to any of my friends who had packet. And at the time, packet was very, well, it was very popular actually in Toronto. Uh, we had a very, a, a thriving packet community throughout Toronto and York Region. It was, it was quite something. And we had nodes that went all the way down into the states. We had nodes that actually went into the internet um, at the time and went into uh, chat rooms. So to be able to, before, you know, even dial-up was getting regular, like a regular thing, we were able to go and chat with people around the world, which when you were showing people, they were blown away because it was something different at the time. So anyways, just splattering of different uh, ham radio software. Okay, so I'm going to do some demos now. Uh, first one is going to be on software-defined radio. Uh, software-defined radio has been getting more and more play these days because practically any modern radio you buy is software-defined. In other words, less electronics, more into software. Um, that there is actually a software-defined radio. The nice thing about it is if something's broken, chances are they'll fix it in the firmware. And we've seen that. Um, a lot of the new mobile radios, um, they, we've seen them come out. They've had all sorts of bugs. You know, a month and a half later, new firmware comes out, all the bugs are gone, or most of them. It's, it's, it's changed, it's really changed the industry. Also, the price point on radios has gone down significantly since uh, software-defined radios have come out. <laughs> So today, so these are just two receivers uh, that are available commonly on the market uh, under $30. And you can have a receiver that will do anywhere from, uh, receive from anywhere from 50 megahertz up to about three gigahertz. Um, I remember I had, I had this one 
few years ago, one of my side jobs, I do lighting and sound in theater. And I happened to uh, be at uh, one of the shows that I was working on. And I had that plugged into my laptop. I was talking to the sound guy. And he was handing out his wireless microphones. And so I said, uh, what frequency are those on? And he told me the frequency range. I said, oh, OK. So I brought up the interface, showed the frequency range. And I said, OK, so you have a one there, one there, one there, one there. Whose is this? Click on it. I'm hearing everything coming through their microphone. So go to a demo, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is what I mean. This is what is generally referred to as the waterfall. Uh, where you see the yellow is where there's a signal of uh, some degree. So let me just adjust the volume. Wow, okay. Turn that down a bit. 104.5. There we go. Anyway, um, it's not picking up very well in here. It's not unusual. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sorry? 105.1. Oh, oh 105.1. Okay, there you go. Sorry? FM? This is FM. Yeah. But I can do FM. Actually, I can choose what I want to do. So right now, this is wide FM. Basically, our, our bandwidth is, is uh, 12 kilohertz. So um, I also have narrow FM. Upper side band, lower side band, which is with carrier, without carrier. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of that. But um, so, anyways, I pulled up this display and I said, "Oh, okay. Uh, you know, here are the different frequencies that you're using. I can listen to any one of them." That's why I was asking Alex, you know, what frequency this was on. <laughs> yeah. One something gigahertz. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, this software won't do the gigahertz. The radio will, but the software won't. But anyways, it uh, it's interesting in the ham world though, because with the transceiving software, it kind of takes some of the fun out of it. I guess you could say. Because gone are the days where you know, you'd go down to your basement, you'd turn your radio on, and you'd run up and down the dial looking for somebody, or you'd just sit there and call CQ. Now guys will come down, turn on the radio, and they'll get this, and go, I know where somebody is. There's somebody talking. There's another one. So it kind of takes the guesswork out of it. Um, on the other hand, as I said, ham radio operators are tinkerers. We like technology and stuff like that, it's cool. <laughs> you know, to be able to just look at it, point and click, and, you know, utilize it. So, it... Uh, so, which, which software package is this? The software itself? Sure. This one here is... It's just called GQRX, and what it is is it's a front end to RTL SDRs. So RTL-SDR is the unit, and well, I showed you a picture of it earlier. And there's all sorts of different versions of the same thing. Like this is one SDR. Let me pull up another one. And then we have Qt SDR. I think this one's working. I only got a few of them uh, running last week. Okay, this one isn't running. But let's 
Let's see if there's another one here. Uh, as you can see, there's lots of lots of different uh, software on here. Most of these are digital modes. So one of the things I mentioned earlier was um, we can do multiple modes, voice, analog, voice, digital, or pure data modes. Um, things like PSK31, for example, is a digital mode primarily used on HF, so your shortwave radios. Um, and it was kind of the predecessor to what I showed for the SDR, the waterfall. So it would show you the same type of thing. It would show you a waterfall display, and then you could see where the different stations were transmitting their digital signals. And it was all text-based. There's also uh, um, amateur television. We've done that in the past. I remember back in the, I guess it was the late 90s, we were doing um, uh, a canoe race in the Holland Marsh. And we had three amateur television cameras set up along the route. And we were broadcasting back to the, the start finish so that people could see where everybody was. You know, things like that. Um, we've, we've tried many, many different things over the years uh, as far as, I'm just going to bring the other one back up. Um, over the years, as far as uh, different transmit methods, including, uh, oh, yeah, still something there. Uh, including there was one uh, that we used packet for that worked really well. It was a horse race, or not a horse race, sorry, a horse ride. And we had 250 horses in the York Region Forest spread out. And we tracked them using ham radios. So we had ham radio operators scattered throughout different checkpoints. And as the horses passed by, we just typed it into our computer, hit enter, a packet went out, got received from at the start finish line to which the um, person who, was, who set all this up was running a uh, very basic uh, code that when it received the packet, it would look at the timestamp, look at the numbers that we typed in, and put everything in, uh, uh, into a nice table. So when any of the organizers wanted to know where anybody was, just went down, there it was. It worked out really well. And over the years, we've tried various methods for various community service projects. For some reason, we still end up using voice, but. So the next one I'm going to do is, or demonstrate is APRS. And Automatic Positioning Reporting System, it is exactly how it sounds. Um, some radios, including this one, has the capability of transmitting has a built-in GPS, and it will transmit my call sign and my location on a beacon. Anybody running the software or looking at the, uh, the website can see where any of the uh, beacons are. So for example, oh, that's interesting. Sorry, it's just this one here, V3GS. That's Jeff Smith. I highly doubt it's transmitting because he passed away three weeks ago. It still might be. It still might be, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> but um, he was actually one of the mentors of our club. He was, uh, he was one of the guys who literally wrote them the Canadian book on amateur radio. Um, so the Canadian Amateur Radio Study Guide, he was one of the writers of it. Brilliant, brilliant man. Um, anyways, so these are different stations that are transmitting. 
We have weather stations, so these are also transmitting full weather details um, from their station. Uh, some of these are links, so the L is a link, and some of them are repeaters. As I mentioned before, um, with repeaters, I can, turn to, I can tune to a repeater frequency and it essentially gives you a, uh, um, a distance, uh, it gives you more distance because I transmit to the repeater, it repeats out. Um, very simple. So right now I am not transmitting because I don't know if it would get very far. Things downtown are, are sporadic anyway. So, but uh, for, for a long time actually, I was running APRS in my vehicle. And so at any given time, regardless of where I was, you could pull it up and actually see where I was driving. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but considering it gives you your speed, it gives you your direction, <laughs> you know. So just another interesting one. Uh, I mentioned, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna jump back to SDR. Uh, one of the things I use my software to find radio for at home is um, ADSB. Does anybody know what ADSB is? All right, that's the signals that come from the airplanes to say the direction, the, the destination, uh, altitude, airspeed, pretty much all the information that aircraft has is transmitted through the AD, ADSB. Um, I can receive those um, on the SDR, plot them on a map. I can click on the, with a lot of the software I have, you can click on the aircraft, get all the information you want of the aircraft. None of it's encrypted. It's all public accessible. Um, so I actually receive that and feed it into uh, FlightAware. So if anybody's used FlightAware to see where a flight is or when a flight's gonna be on time in that, I actually, um, uh, feed information into them. So it's kind of neat. <laughs> okay, and the last sort of demonstration I'm going to give is on, and it uh, doesn't look like anybody's talking, uh, is on, I... oh, there is too. There we go, DMR, digital mobile radio. Um, a lot of the radio um, period is going digital. All the fire department, police, ambulance, they've all gone digital. Uh, federal government's all gone digital these days. Ham radio has gone digital. We've actually have five different digital modes, uh, which can get very confusing. Um, I was out of the hobby for about 10 years and uh, this year I decided to kind of get back into it. And this is one of the things that was kind of drawing me back, getting into new technology, learning some of these new technologies, and digital mobile radio is one of them. Currently, and just as I turn up the volume, the person stopped talking. I don't know. I meant to give you. There's a document called Reflections on Reflectors. So, and uh, it goes into some of the backstory. Yeah. So this is a conversation that's currently being had over the internet and I know on radio. So, um, what's gotten I popular? And, and I can't lift this up very far. Yeah. I'll show it to. Um, spread it around later, is hotspots. What hotspots are is they're basically a little tiny repeater, connects up to your Wi-Fi, and it acts as the go-between between your radio and the internet. And then on the other end, somebody else has a little tiny hotspot that acts as a go-between. Or there's a repeater, an antenna somewhere, that you can connect to via the internet and go out and talk wherever. Uh, this has opened up a huge uh, opportunity for amateur radio operators who don't have the capability of doing things like HF. HF is, uh, well, 
the, the big old radios that you see in all the movies, it's high frequency, short wave, you need big antennas to do it well. Um, and if you don't have that equipment or you live in a condo, let's say, it's kind of difficult to do that. <laughs> so DMR and other digital modes have opened up the capability of hams reaching out from around the world. And as I said, I just got into DMR and other digital modes. And it's quite interesting to listen to when you have, um, there's one, what we call a net. And a net is basically hams from a specific area checking in. And most of them have a topic of the day. And then they discuss the topic. If anybody has anything to add, they add. If anybody has any questions, sort of like when we do our question and answer here. Um, there's one net that happens every Saturday. It takes about two and a half to three hours because it's a worldwide net. And there could be upwards of 300 people that check in. <laughs> it's quite something to listen to. It really is. They've had to break it down into a script and explicitly ask for people to check in from different parts of the world just to keep some order to it. it it's, it's quite interesting. Um, the other cool part about the digital modes is the information you get. So this radio has the capability of having 400,000 unique uh, uh, call signs in it, in the directory. Um, I can download the directory and anytime anybody is coming through here or transmitting through a repeater or direct to, direct to radio, I can see who I'm talking to. Like right now, Peter's talking, okay? That is kind of interesting um, because ham radio operators, we don't have last names. <laughs> it's just a thing. It's, you know, I'm Alan, VA3WAH. I don't have a last name. Um, and that's just how it is. So this, this has really made the hobby interesting. Um, the, I, I've kind of gotten addicted to the, to the, uh, to the hotspots. Uh, so I'm just going to, radio's not going to like this, but oh well. So there's the hotspot. And that's running a Raspberry Pi Zero, running Raspberry M, and the what's called Pi Star, which is the software that um, there's a little radio hat for the Raspberry Pi that the Pi Star works with to do the transmitting and receiving. And yeah, that there, you're looking at like $75 all in for something like this. I also have two more at home that are a little more, um, well, there's just more to them. <laughs> Uh, that are, uh, have a few more toys and gadgets to them. But, I mean, it's something that when you're just getting into the hobby, you can, you can afford, you can get into easily. Um, even the radios, like this, this radio here, uh, these can be had for under $300. That's huge. I mean, back when I was getting into the radio, uh, getting into ham radio, the cheapest radio on the market, I think, if I remember correctly, was Radio Shacks. And surprisingly, it was, it was an excellent radio. It was designed by one of the leading manufacturers of the time, but it was still a $500 radio. And that was, that was cheap. I mean, it was, it was far cheaper than anything else on the market at the time. But now you're getting radios that you can pick up for $45. So it, it lends to people getting into the hobby. So that's all I had. Any questions? Right. Discussions? Oh, yes. Please use the microphone if you have any questions. When you showed the diagram yeah. of, of the waveforms, were those two sidebands? Is that what? What was going on? No, that was FM. So that was that was frequency modulation. So you don't have a you don't have a sideband on that. Okay. So why were there two symmetric? Oh, uh, let me go 
go back. Were you possibly looking at two radio stations? Maybe. Is it 104.5 or something? You were... And 105.1, is it every station or Shelby? Uh, yeah, you're probably seeing two different radio stations. So that's 104.5. That's 105.1. Okay. Yeah, it yeah does. I noticed that. <laughs> yes. That's right. That's right. And I can actually adjust the width of that um, to give you to give a better better audio as well. Well, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. When you mentioned uh, <laughs> when you mentioned uh, software defined radio, yes. Uh, how much of, of it is really software defined, and how much is basically pinned down by the U.S. FCC and say, "Thou shalt not fiddle." Um, pretty much all of your filters. Um, you still have you still have VFOs. Uh, for your input or for your input and your output, but all of your filters are all software defined. Um, you know what? Honestly, most of it's software defined, and the FCC and Industry Canada and many of the governing bodies, they aren't as concerned with the amateur radio side of things as they are with the commercial side of things. Yeah. So they allow us to tinker. They don't want the commercial side to tinker. I remember when this radio was released, when you got it, it was wide open. You could transmit on any frequency from, I think it was 130 up through to well, with, well beyond the amateur radio band. Um, and the FCC didn't like that. So they actually told the company who is the distributor in the US that they had to lock them down. So there's a quick little key combination that you can do, which I could undo at any point, um, that locks it down to just the VHF and UHF ham radio bands. Yeah. But that can receive out of band. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, w I was wondering, because you're a licensed amateur, yeah. as opposed to manu uh, you know, offshore manufacturers of Wi-Fi equipment, who have been known to do things wrong. And I was wondering, why did you get treated like human beings and the, and the Wi-Fi folks get, get snarled at? <laughs> we actually have frequencies in the Wi-Fi bands. Yeah, uh, is, is it six meters? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, in the um, uh, 1.2 gigahertz hmm. bands, we have, we have frequencies in there. And we have been known to use them uh, for mesh networking. And yeah. the difference is, I can transmit on that frequency at 100 watts. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and my, 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 uh, uh, my Wi-Fi is definitely not going to run that far. No. No. <laughs> How many orders of magnitude difference? 100, 100 watts versus a fraction of a watt. Maximum probably one watt. I think it's maximum one watt. Yeah. yeah. No. Can you cook No. No. No, they'd have attenuators on them. Yeah. They would be deafened, perhaps, <laughs> but certainly not damaged. <laughs> and actually, we had, uh, we were playing around with uh, mesh networking uh, a number of years ago. One, uh, one of our, our club members, he works for Seneca College at the campus at Seven and Allstate Parkway. And he had, uh, he had a great boss at the time who allowed him to have antennas on the roof. And he had three antennas, one pointed at Newmarket, one pointed at uh, Markham, um, and uh, one pointed to Peel region area, that direction, uh, doing uh, mesh networking. Mm -hmm. So 
if I had the right antenna from my condo, I could actually have pointed it right to him and had a connection with him. Yeah. Impressive. Uh, the, reason, the reason I asked is that the US FCC got into a loud debate with, among other people, uh, uh, Vint Cerf and uh, David Tate, and uh, got a very large uh, and rather long uh, technical petition from the Linux community saying, now, calm down, guys, and let's do, let's do the wife the Wi-Fi commercial components right and not what not basically prohibit the use of Linux as a replacement for the crap that they had. Mm -hmm. They very reasonably backed off on that and said, we're more concerned that, that people don't ship you shit. <laughs> I have a Problem. I'd like to listen to a, a, a broadcast, an FM station from uh, Buffalo, uh, 94.5. S um, sometimes I can get to very good reception, and other times it sounds as though somebody's frying bacon in the uh, background. Um, I do have an SDR dongle, and I was wondering if I, if I can use it in any way to try and isolate the cause of that uh, background noise and possibly eliminate it. Is there anything, any possibility that I, um, it would be useful? Yes, actually. Um, I'm sure there is. There's the, oh, that's interesting. Um, no, sorry, my, my screen on my laptop's going to sleep, but that's still going, which I think is very odd. Anyways, um, the SDR software actually has several different filters in it. Mm -hmm. And it also has the capability of changing things like your input DB, um, your, uh, your bandwidth, so the, the width of the frequency that you're actually trying to get. And just by doing that, sometimes you can clean up the signal. Uh, also, it depends on time of day. That really makes a difference. Um, but you, you should be able to do it. Weather conditions seem to uh, have a big influence. Absolutely. Less with FM than with like short wave, but definitely conditions change. Um, we just went through a, a pretty bad period for uh, certain ham radio bands recently. I think it was 40 meters was pretty much useless for a while just because of the, um, uh, the various conditions of the atmosphere, various uh, sunspots, things like that. They all make, a, make a, a huge difference in radio. I know there's been some, some spectacular um, auroras recently, and I imagine that's uh, probably... Uh... That would definitely do it. <laughs> Chris? Yes. Um... Stepping back to that that listing of, of different pieces of software, you had uh, I, I counted four columns of twenty four apiece. Um, question about that. So, to what degree have you? How many of these have you used? How many? And and how complete a list is this? This is, is nowhere this, nowhere this near is a complete list. Ten percent, or is this five percent, or is how? Uh, um. I'd say probably, I'm going to guess and say 40%, give or take. Okay, so it's um, two or three times as much as this. Yeah, yeah. Cool. How many have I used? Uh, I'd say a fraction. Some of them, uh, for example, Jack Audio is not ham radio specific, but definitely mm -hmm. adjacent. Um, for example, with SDR, uh, you have the capability of, if you have Jack Audio running properly, and I was trying to get it running, it, it, it's, it's tricky, um, especially on the, uh, the ThinkPad. But um, you can take that audio signal and pipe it to a decoder. So instead of it being an audio signal, maybe it's a digital signal. And you can pipe it to a decoder and decode that signal, for example. Um, some of the other ones I've used... 
stand back and actually read some of these. Um, I've used XAPRS as I, as I demonstrated, APRS, Automatic Positioning Reporting System. Um, I've probably only used about half a dozen of these. Um, some of them are logging programs. So like uh, PYQSO, a QSO is a contact. So when we make a contact with somebody, that's a QSO. A lot of hams will log all of their contacts and then uh, they'll submit them for contests or for getting various certificates, stuff like that. So, but yeah. And I guess I, a side thing on that as you, uh, it's clear that there are radios that are accessible across the internet. So you, could, you could access a radio in Michigan and, and capture things through there. How does that sort of thing get counted for, for QSOs and such like? How do they, um, like, like I could in theory not have a radio at all and remote connect and I see your, I see your teeth cringing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, it's funny you say that. There's a new digital mode called uh, P8, if I remember correctly on HF, and from what I understand, and I've only looked at it briefly because I don't have HF capabilities at home, um, the software will actually log contacts. Because it's a digital mode, so you're, you're making a, con but it's logging contacts. So who's to say that you're sitting there when it's logging a contact? Who's making the contact, the person or the software? Right, and to, to your point, right? Um, how do you make that, that contact? Well, with uh, analog, like with, with voice, um, you log it with the QSO Bureau. And if somebody else logs your contact, then there's a handshake, and now it's been confirmed that you have a contact. Um, when, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So for field day, for example, we submit all of our logs. So all of our contact logs we submit. And now it's actually a lot easier and it's a lot faster now that uh, everything's being digitized because it used to be crazy. We'd actually send in an envelope and somebody would actually have to go through it. And... Uh, the QSO cards? Oh yeah, and they, there still are QSO cards. The funny thing, or QSL cards, I should say. The, the funny thing with QSL cards, though, is they've gone digital as well. <laughs> so people will actually go on to the QSL Bureau and log your contact right there, and you get their card digitally. I guess it saves on postage. I, I agree. And you know what? It's funny because a lot of people who, have, who were into shortwave did that. Um, you know, you'd listen to a shortwave station and then you'd contact them via mail to get a QSL card back from them because it was only one way, obviously. But uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Any other questions, comments, discussion points? Okay. Thank you very much.